I've read and heard Rudy speak of uh, the friendly Jewish woman uh, for many decades now. And this uh, paper, again, brings it all back. But now it's put into the context of what's unfolding um, in all seriousness and deadliness in our society and world today, namely uh, the identitarian movements, uh, the particularized identitarian movements of identity politics and identity ideology. Um, Rudy, you mentioned the notion or the reality of the armed confrontation in East Lansing uh, last week uh, of the extreme radical right uh, intimidating and confronting uh, people that are in the state legislature um, as well as Governor Whitmer. Whitmer. Um, this has already been projected to be the case uh, at the voting polling places uh, come November in what are called the key states uh, for Trump's uh, re-election campaign, Michigan, Wisconsin, Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, particularly, that there will be these armed uh, vigilantes um, with their flak jackets on and their automatic weapons um, and all of that. And your story, your remembrance, which is really important. While I was reading this again, uh, the Baal Shem Tov's statement that remembrance is the way uh, to redemption, forgetfulness is the path to hell. Um, that remembrance has to be made. Um, and it, I wish there would have been more people in this uh, discourse to, to hear it uh, and get involved in the, the conversation. But nevertheless, um, I see in the top of my screen that, Jeremiah, you're recording this, and that's marvelous. And Dustin, I'm quite sure this will make the uh, YouTube uh file as well. The thing that I struggle with, uh, with all of this right now, um, not only the distortions, the lies, uh, the mendacity uh, that's being attributed to this coronavirus pandemic as being um, the cause not only of China, but also is the cause of particular groups within the United States. Once again, the innocent victims of the capitalist system, the neoliberal capitalist system. And that's the thing that I'm seeing, not in your article, Rudy, because it wasn't really about that, but the context of capitalism has to be brought into this. Um, Horkheimer, we know this, Horkheimer made the statement that if, you're, if you can't speak about fascism, um, you shouldn't speak about capitalism. I like to flip that over and say, if you can't talk about capitalism, then you shouldn't be talking about fascism or identity politics, or identity ideology, and that's exactly what's not happening. Once again, the capitalist system, the capitalist elite class, uh, the whole principle of wealth distribution um, that's going upwards towards uh, the one one thousandth of a percent of the population is sidelined. It's put behind the curtain again, and we're left with these fragmentary issues, which plays right into the particularized identity um, politics. Zizek uh, stated a few years ago that the real battleground of identity politics 
is not about the particularization of particular groups based on race or class or sex or ideology or nationality or whatever, but the struggle of identity politics is a struggle for universality. That can be done through the process of domination, which all of the militias are doing right now, just as the Nazis did. Um, how do we move? The struggle for universality. If, let me put it this way, if the identity, the struggle for identity politics and the ideology that goes right along with this is particularized, how do we move that discourse to speak about this universality over within the capitalist, uh, neoliberal, globalized capitalist system? How do we move the discourse from this particularization of us against them, you against me, me against you, to this notion of solidarity? Um, Brecht made, uh, in his letter to the... Uh, um, it wasn't a letter, it was a poem. Uh, on the first article of the Weimar Constitution, 1929, he asked the question, uh, which I think has to be asked now. Um, he said, all state authority emanates from the people. Uh, die Staatsgewalt geht vom Volke aus. Aber... Will Gates see him? Will Gates see him? Where does this power go? What's the direction? What's the future? I mean, that we're pointing to. What's the future that these identity groups are focusing on, directing towards? Is it solidarity? Is it the golden rule from all of the world religions? Is it Kant's categorical imperative. If something can't be made into a universal law, then it can't stand. How do we get this back? How do we get this thinking back? This is dialectics, I know this. But how do we do this? The churches aren't doing it. As a former minister, I'm still involved in it. Um, it's disgusting. The key that many of the churches are doing is focusing on one identity group, the LGBTQ group. And they do need support. They do need protection. But it's much greater than that. How do we get to the greatness of the universality, the dialectic between the universal and the particular? Going back to Hegel again, how do we do this? I'll just leave that there. I'll stop. So I, um, in uh, one of my classes recently, um, was having a discussion about really exactly that question. Um, and something that um, I want to say the students in general agreed upon was the idea that uh, we're not ready for universality yet because um, differences haven't been articulated enough yet. Um, so that, that was an answer that they gave. Um, so I think that that's, that's worth noting, um, even at least in the sense that there's probably a lot of people who, uh, share that sentiment. Um, I, I worry that, you know, how long can we really wait? <laughs> um, but, uh, but that may be something, um, the, the notion that, there's a certain kind of healing that has to come through acknowledging differences before we can be reunited. Um, and, and I can certainly see that perspective. And, and, and then I also worry that the, the healing that comes from acknowledging differences is also uh, coming along with uh, uh, hatred and violence um, based on differences. I'm not arguing for an essentialist notion of universality, namely that there's something out there that we have to appeal to again, a god, a kingdom, some form of mysticism of otherness, but more of a materialistic otherness that 
recognizes our differences, recognizes uh, and admits to our prejudices, but not just, I mean, there's a story where um, three, um, three Jewish people came to the synagogue and they came to publicly confess their sins. One was a mighty rabbi, and the rabbi confessed that um, he wasn't worthy of God's forgiveness, worthy of God's grace. He was so miserable and so pathetic, he didn't deserve any of God's grace. The second Jewish man was a uh, wealthy businessman who said the exact same thing. I'm not worthy of your grace, O oh God. Finally, there was a regular poor Jew that came up and said, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy also of God's grace. At that point, the rabbi and the businessman looked at each other and said, how dare he try to take our identity of not being worthy before God? We're the ones that aren't worthy. We can flip this, our admittance of guilt, our admittance of our failures, our admittance of our prejudices into once again a dominational theory. I'm more guilty than you. How dare you try to take my spot? Let me tell you what's wrong with you, though, because I've already admitted my guilt. That's the moral of that story. It can flip over and become just as destructive and dominational. Whereas, I mean, I go back to Habermas's communicative uh, praxis, his discourse ethics. Um, we respect each other. There's mutual recognition in the pursuit of honesty and truth, um, rightness uh, within a solidarity community. That has to be created. But given the, the hell that's unfolding on us now, how do we do that? I mean, this has got to be stopped or we're going to go far deeper into hell than Dante ever imagined. In a way, this is calling for a, a rebirth of humanism in the sense of recognizing that there is a, recognizing the sameness within people just on the basis of their humanity. There's a bit of a quandary in the sense that my, the, the universality, the sense of fundamental equality of all people, that's, that's a sentiment which is going to come from the left, the political left. And the left is not really focused on that right now. Some of what's going around is, um, you know, the notion that uh, talking about universality um, ignores differences and also humanism and sort of um, universalistic thought comes out of the West and is therefore a colonizing force when it's used. Um, so uh, recognizing that there is there is legitimacy to that argument, but then at the same time, ultimately, we need what you're what you're talking about. How do we preserve these critiques and this understanding about um, kind of the dominance of the West in the world and then still, but, but do that without letting go of the importance of things like recognizing common humanity and, you know, the good points about universality, which we ultimately need in order to actually have um, a world that's not fragmented in the way that it currently is. I'm wondering in regards to Hegelian dialectics, there really is no individuality true individuality without a sense of the universal. There's a dialectic moving back and forth between the universality and the individuality or the particularity, which uh, if it's left just in these two categories, you end up with a reified dualism, which can't do very much but create conflict and hierarchy and domination, and then we go back to structural functionalism, as well as uh, uh, the autopoiesis of uh, Luhmann system theory, it takes care of itself. You know, and then we're right back, uh, Benjamin quoted uh, a French statement uh, about the capitalist system, sans rêve, uh, sans et sans merci, a system that has no dream, and no mercy. That's what a dualism without a dialogue, a discourse of going beyond where we are. Uh, Rudy's 
and Heraclitus is Pante Rey. All things change. If they reify, there's no changing. We have to figure out how to move beyond these fragmented identity uh, politics that are circulating and uh, concretizing into combatant groups. And I don't see, I know you mentioned the left. I don't think we have a left, not as a movement. There's four leftists here, uh, critical theorists, looking for alternative future three, Rudy. How do we get there? How do we create it? Uh, this is part of it. There's no question. Discourse, respect, justice. But when people are shot in the back of the head doing their job at a parking lot in Texas, as a uh, person was shot last week, discourse is almost terminated. I'm trying to find a way to move out of this theoretically, but practically, concretely. How do we do that? How do we? And this is part of it. There's no question, but that's my quandary. It's been my quandary for decades now. How do we do this? I've been out in the street, as most all of us have been, marching, screaming, lecturing, teaching, uh, going to what used to be unions, speaking to the workers. Uh, didn't really accomplish much because here we are. I think um, what you said, you know, about that we, whatever we said today, one must also always think that one has to talk about capitalism. You were right. And uh, one has to be more materialistic and one has to define capitalism and socialism clearly because there are such confusing uh, ideas about it, what it may be. So to define <clears throat> capitalism as the private appropriation of collective labor and socialism as the collective appropriation of collective surplus labor, that definition could make the discourse more precise. So one cannot have a universal freedom of all when one has this contradiction of private people appropriating collective labor, as it happens here to 150 million workers. Right. And this objective movement of capital, not necessarily the capitalist, but of capital and the catastrophic situation in which it finds itself, people act as if they would come out again and it would be the same as before. Right. This illness has driven a capitalistic crisis, which would have come anyway, like in 2008, it would have come without the illness, but the illness has pushed it into the extreme now. And uh, we know that Marx said that, um, you know, even the most limited bourgeois will learn what dialectics is from the, um, from the uh, crisis, from the depressions, from the depressions. And uh, so what Trump tells us is we have to forget when we get out of this, we have to forget what was and so on. That is a satanic thing that forgetting that means we have to remember not only the horrible illness, but to remember what, what, where it has pushed the capitalistic system at this moment. There's no guarantee that there will be any private appropriation left mm -hmm. after this catastrophe has gone through. So we knew that some of these depressions will be the last one. It is very well possible that this depression, which is deeper now than 1929, will be the last one. And so we can think about the subjective side of all that, what we talk and so on, but there is an objective process. Capital itself right. as a mode of production is moving like the slaveholders did, like the feudal lords did, so the capitalists do. And that is, of course, the type of dangerous type of thinking which we can hardly do and which we shy away from and talk about value things and so on. But this, you were right, this is the fundamental issue which affects all of us. Right. That means a large majority of people are workers. We are all workers. We are professors, but we are workers. The medical doctors, they are all workers. They all product, produce surplus value, which is appropriated by a small elite, which then can use this tremendous economic power in order to control the parties and everything. So that is what we have to face with, as painful as it is, and as dangerous as it is, that's it. So they were the slaveholders, they were the feudal lords, 
and then now they are the cabinets in charge. They are still in charge, and they are still the army, and they support those uh, those groups there because Trump said Michigan had to be liberated. Yeah. And when uh, when they finally tried to liberate them, he told the governor here she should negotiate with these groups because they were fine people and so on. So there we see from these issues where we stand at this moment. He wants to open up because he knows that capitalism from day to day goes deeper and deeper into nothingness. Mm -hmm. So um, that is the pressure there. Open it in spite of the illness. So let some die. They die anyway. And so on. You hear all these fascist statements. Yeah. They die anyway. So, um, so therefore to concentrate on these two definitions mm -hmm. in our discourse and thinking as hard as it is, as unpopular as it is, and so on, and to unite people to think about these two additions, things. Now, the private appropriation of collective labor, the collective appropriation, this horrible contradiction gives birth to all the other contradictions, which are distractions. Mm -hmm. from this core problem on which they all depend, which all these other issues depend. And those distractions are exactly what everybody focuses on. Yeah, right, right. right. As long as that focus is there, there is no real cure going to be cured. And that, at the moment when the system is nose diving, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think, I think Trump knows what is going on. They know what is going on with capitalism at this moment. Yeah, and uh, of course we have the fascists marching in Lansing. But what when the socialists are starting to march in Lansing, because they are in the bushes as well. You know, you say there's no left, but there are lots of people around the globe. You know, who have not given up. I mean, in Russia, I continue contact with them. All the universities still are full of Marxist teachers. You know, and my friends who are nonconformists who don't want to have that. Soviet Marxism and so on, are banned. They are not allowed even to talk in these universities because in Petroka, in Petrograd or whatever, because they are nonconformists. They don't take the class struggle serious. They want to be nonviolent and so on. So. But the universal means the universal freedom, not only the freedom of a few of slaveholders, capitalists, or student lords or so, but the freedom of all. This universal thing cannot be reached. And that this has been transformed into an ideology which legitimates capitalism, yeah. that we call this the free world or the leader of the free world and so on. This ideology, this untruth there covers everything and is in the brains of people. And we are involved. We have our pension funds in this whole thing there. Some of us are in Wall Street and so on. That's where we want to live after we are retired and so on. So we are part of this whole thing. We are thinking against ourselves in this whole thing. But uh, I think we have to return to this very materialistic reality of the private appropriation of collective labor and not make it more and more private as we have it from Reagan on. They thought the system would not have a catastrophe like this anymore and one could deregulate and one could privatize. And it nosedived in 2008 and it would have no dive, nosedived without the illness. But the illness pushes it to an, to an unbelievable extreme.